Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Kristen has a question. What is the risk of iatrogenic jaw fracture during extraction in the canine patient? And that, uh, it, it, that's a great question, and let me go uh, to the keynote, and I'll show you what we're talking about, and I'll describe it for our podcast listeners. So when we have a lucency adjacent to the apex of the tooth, then oftentimes that lucency is like you see in this image where describing this the roots of the canine tooth are not really that close at all to the ventral cortex of the mandible and it would take a tremendous lucency to extend to that point with the roots that far away from the ventral cortex and even then sometimes there's enough bone stability there that it's not going to be a problem. In this case, let's say it does extend to the cortex. You've got a lucency around the mesial root. It's not that big, but it's pretty dense. It extends to the cortex and breaks through the cortex somewhere, but there's no bone loss down to that, and the reason why that tooth has the lucency is because it was compromised endodontically or uh, either through open fracture or through uh, trauma and chronic pulpitis. And with that lucency and with those tooth roots being that far away and no bone loss, there's almost no chance of, of fracture of that mandible if you know how to do the correct technique. So that's the answer to that question from that standpoint. But if there's bone loss that surrounds that entire uh, two root structure there, from the standpoint of all the way to the apex and those root apices are closer to the ventral cortex of the mandible which happens in small dogs right this uh, this case that we're describing is probably a medium sized dog so the roots aren't all the way down to the ventral cortex but in small dogs the tooth roots and the crown are too big hence the problem with crowding of, of the crowns and periodontal disease with smaller dogs and the fact that those teeth are too big for their mouths. And so with that, we often get bone loss that's significant starting at the marginal bone level where the periodontal disease is working its way down, killing the tooth, then producing periapical lucencies and or migrating down that bone or that tooth root bone interface destroying the bone so that that tooth might even be a little bit mobile, <clears throat> then that becomes uh, an issue sometimes with fracture if the proper technique's not used. So many of our students that even come to our wet labs are apprehensive and rightfully so about extracting that tooth in particular if there's a lot of bone loss and possibly that tooth in particular even if there's no bone loss as it's perceived as a difficult extraction. In reality, it's not that difficult. And if you have the proper training, 
<laughs> and we provide that with our wet labs. We've got those coming up in June. You can find those at veterinarydentistry.net. Uh, just look at my name down there and you'll see the link. You can register for the, the course in Atlanta at our new teaching center, brand new. We've only used it twice and it's incredible in, uh, in north of Atlanta in Sandy Springs. So I'd love to see you guys there. But anyway, again, that's one of those tangents I get off on. Off on. <laughs> Uh, but with, with that being said, that tooth and the mandibular canine are the ones that fracture jaw uh, uh, structure most often during extractions with situations where the practitioner may not be that comfortable with the extractions and so those are often referred. And if you're not comfortable with that, I would recommend that, that you refer as well. But if you're comfortable, uh, perfectly good technique that you've taught, uh, you've been taught, then certainly fine to do that. So. That uh, hopefully that answers your question. That's a long uh, answer, Christian uh, Kristen, but uh, that's the answer to that uh, that question. Sue Bowman is the Denton Trail mention made with the Explorer, and yes, it indeed it is the Dental Explorer, which is on the other side usually of your uh, periodontal probe. That's that is um, what's the term. Uh, is scored in millimeters generally uh, to let you measure periodontal pockets and attachment loss with gingival recession and both uh, or both combined. And uh, is it done in the awake patient? No, it's done in the patient under anesthesia. You could possibly do it in the awake patient if you have a super good awake patient, but if that patient's head moves, that's a super sharp point. Therein lies the problem. So I would suggest that in all cases, uh, with few exceptions, that you do it under general anesthesia. It's got to be evaluated anyway, uh, and your radiographs are super important if there is something that is uh, associated with an abrasion of a tooth, and so that determination, you need radiographs anyway because that tooth has been traumatized, so do it under anesthesia, Sue, uh, would be the best way to, to answer that. Haley Erola. Uh, Haley, thanks for your question. Chevron affects something that affects more breeds than others. Is it common to see more on the maxillary or the mandibular teeth? And we generally see that in several places. One is the, the four central maxillary incisors, real common. The canine teeth, especially the maxillary canine, uh, has a chevron effect or it may have an effect from superimposition of the nasal cavity over the apex, which may look like a huge chevron effect or a huge lucency, so you have to be really discerning in order to make that call on the maxillary canines. Mandibular canines may have some of that, but usually not. Uh, those, if you see a lucency, you want to look at the other side on those for sure, on the apex of the mandibular canines. And then the other place that you'll see those is the mandibular first and second molar more common in the mandibular first molar i think than than most teeth you always want to compare that to the other side as well and make sure that your views are both parallel which is a little easier to do if you're comparing canine to canine in the maxilla a little bit more difficult because you have to have the same pretty much the same angle of the tube head in order to compare really accurately, but you'll get a general idea. And if there's any question, then you either uh, can have a, uh, somebody consult with you on that radiograph after the patient wakes up. You don't want to assume that it's an extraction unless you know for sure. Certainly training in radiographic interpretation will help. We've got an online course for that at that URL that I mentioned before, uh, five hours of just radiographic interpretation. So those things and the experience will help you make those determinations on that. So thanks, Haley, for that, uh, for that um, question. So let's go down to the next question. Uh, Michelle Pang, dental composites recommended to restore defects, seal dental tubules, and protect the underlying tooth structure. How long does it last? Assuming normal everyday mastication. So if, if you have composite on there, <coughs> excuse me, and you have a bonding agent under there, which is, is definitely what you want to do. The dentin uh, bonds to that in the, in the connective tissue of the dentin, in the tubules and in the matrix. And that's pretty much 
a permanent thing. Uh, the composite could get knocked off, certainly. And so if you're using composite, which very few people listening today are, uh, there, there are not very many people who are using composite. They might be bonding, but we teach that in the advanced course. So if you're not doing that, that's where you get that information. But if you are um, looking to how long it lasts, if, you, if you're just bonding a minor defect in the dentin, that's going to last uh, until uh, tertiary dentin comes in and replaces that, or it's, it's, it's essentially forever. You want to monitor that tooth because if you've got that insult into dentin and you're looking at it day one, let's say it comes in Monday, you don't know when that occurred. So it might have occurred two months ago and we haven't had chances for the bacteria to get into that dentin, kill the pulp, and show radiographic changes as a, as a subsequent result. So you always want to check that down the road a couple months after that and make sure that you're, you're up to, uh, up to uh, actually uh, uh, six months after that or so. Uh, to make sure that there's no changes. If the patient's older, you probably want to go a year uh, because the canal is smaller and the changes are much more slowly to develop. So those are kind of the guidelines that you'd use for that. And mastication is not going to alter that uh, for the most part. So good question there. Uh, Eric Yeager, uh, totally a business question, uh, more than a health care question. Do you think it's financially justifiable to learn restoration work in general practice? And I think it's super common to find it. And we get a lot of questions in courses about restorations and bonding. And it's not that super difficult to learn bonding. You want to know the basic principles of cavity preparation and the physiology of bonding to make determinations based on that knowledge. So that's a course uh, in itself. So great question. Hope I answered that, Eric. Uh, it is indeed justifiable to learn that and you just need to invest the time to, to get that kind of training. So Monique has a, a question with a tooth that has only a root fracture would there ever be a time where the tooth could stay? And that's a great that's a great question and yes indeed a lot of times and maybe maybe more often than not that tooth can stay if you've got a tooth that is undergoing resorption around a fracture but it's under the bone and there's no periodontal changes there then that is is probably never going to be a problem so that root fracture under the bone level with no perio care or no perio involvement uh, it does not require extraction as long as there's no lucency there if there is a lucency present, then with that lucency, you want to make sure that it is indeed a lucency and not a chevron sign. With a case where you have radiographic changes, like the one you're looking at if you're live and the one I'll describe if you're watching this on the pod or listening to this on the podcast, we've got an enlarged periodontal ligament space around the root segment, which means it's dislodged from the bone and or it has periodontal disease associated with it, destroying the bone adjacent to it. In either case, that tooth crown is probably mobile and so that would be another indication along with what it looks like radiographically and what it probes as when you probe it in order to make a determination that that needs to be extracted. So radiographically if you can see that there's marginal bone to fracture communication so where the tooth root and the bone are supposed to be and where the fracture is there's open space in the radiograph and or you have mobility of that crown, those are indications where not only the crown needs to be taken off, but that tooth root needs to be extracted, whether it has a lucency or not, uh, because it's probably gonna establish a lucency given enough time if there's periodontal involvement. 
If there's a lucency in addition to that, then that means the tooth is already dead and the bacteria have gotten out, destroyed the bone around the root tip, and so that's certainly a definite indication for extraction of that segment. So I hope that answers your question. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.